Hidden away high above the University of London is a library that few ever get to see. Its books explore stories so strange they make even the most skeptical at least wonder. They are stories that we can't explain. We can merely present the evidence and leave you to make up your own minds. There is no doubt at all, however, in the minds of the people who claim to have gone through these experiences, they are ordinary people, they come from ordinary places. Their stories are certainly strange. But are they true? <laughs> Harry Price, psychic investigator. He spent a lifetime collecting all these books in his quest to explain the unexplained. When he died, he left them to the university, where they've continued to baffle the keenest brains around. Tonight we have two extraordinary stories for you, told through drama reconstruction and interviews with those involved. One is about an Irish family, separated in childhood, and now reunited by a woman who says she's the reincarnation of their mother. But first, the naked eye can see stars hundreds of light years away. The most powerful telescopes can see hundreds of millions of light years away. In all that space, is there even the remotest chance that there are life forms elsewhere in the universe which can reach us? And if there are, why would they choose to descend on one small town more than anywhere else? Todmorden, buried deep between windswept Pennine moorlands. Obscure, isolated, and the epicenter of UFO activity in the British Isles. A tenth of sightings are around this town alone. Our story begins with a discovery in a coal yard which even now, more than ten years on, remains a mystery. He's up there. Alan Godfrey, at the time a constable in the Todmorden police force, was called to the scene. He wasn't there a few hours ago. Lying on top of a pile of coal was a man, dead. He had this terrifying expression. I can only describe it as whatever he'd last saw really terrified him. There was no footprints belonging to him, uh, disturbance on the coal. And so how did he get up there? You know, I couldn't, I couldn't work out. I could see that on the top of his head there were individual burn marks. And at the back of the neck there was... a. Uh, a rather large weeping type of burn, and there'd been like an ointment smeared on it. The dead man was Zygmunt Adamski, a retired miner, who disappeared five days earlier from a town 20 miles away. The coroner had to record an open verdict. He's still baffled by the questions surrounding the case, like what was the substance on the dead man's neck? This is one of the most um, puzzling cases that I've come across in 25 years. If somebody proved to me that UFOs exist and that there was one around there at that time and that in some way we could associate it with this case, then perhaps I might say I'd only raise half an eyebrow. On the moors above Todmorden, next to what's said to be the highest bus stop in Britain, is the Deer Play Inn. One night in 1989, the landlady awoke to see an amazing sight. Well, I never took uh, UFOs seriously at all. So one night my husband came in to the bedroom and I was asleep and he came in and said, come on, look at this, Val. And I, I came into the lounge and I saw this light behind that cottage there. It went right across the moor. It, came, it went about 50 miles an hour, came on the car park and lit the car park up like it was daylight. Absolutely, like daylight. I can't believe it. I just don't know. My husband said to me, well, explain that, and I can't explain it. A few miles away, at about seven o'clock one evening last August, Joanne Elledge, Sarah Wolfenden and Amy Connolly were out with friends. We were just walking up the road, along the road, and uh, one of our friends said, you know, what's that over there, and jumped on the wall. So we just got on the wall and had a look, and it was just like behind us, on the, oh, just above the forest, and it just seemed to be hovering and watched it for about ten minutes. I couldn't believe that there was some, something there that weren't an aeroplane or a helicopter or anything like that. We knew it wasn't a normal aircraft or anything. Oh, gosh, really, yeah, we just couldn't say anything, just kept watching that. 
But the most extraordinary story must be that of Alan Godfrey, the policeman who made the find on the coal heap. Five months later, he was on duty early one morning when there were reports of cows loose on a council estate. I've been sent to investigate this herd of cows. So I was driving up the road here, and I was going to turn right up Fernley Road there to the council estate when I could see in front of me up here this object. It looked to be completely blocking the road. As I get nearer and nearer towards its object, I could see that it wasn't quite what I was expecting to meet at five o'clock or whatever on a, on, a, on a November morning in Tomody. It was diamond shaped. The bottom half of the object was spinning. It was hovering about five foot off, off the ground. The I could see the it was about 20 feet wide, 14 feet high. I tried that several times and it just didn't work. I just couldn't uh, contact anybody. So I picked my clipboard up and I started drawing a sketch of it. And then suddenly, I was at the other side of the object and it had gone. It had, uh, I was like another 50, 100 yards at Philip Road driving. What's up? You're not going to believe what I've just seen. What? Get in. Okay. So we got out of the car like and we examined the, 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 the road surface, windows, which was like was a whirlpool been. dry. Something really hot had been hovering above there. Uh, we could see the, all these loose leaves and broken branches there. So he was convinced something had been there. We thought it might have gone in this object, wherever it had gone, that might have gone into the adjoining park. When we got in there, we could see this herd of cows right in the middle of the rugby pitch. they have been raining all night, but there's no hoof prints belonging to them. How they got there? It just looked as though, plop, somebody dropped them there, you know? It sounds incredible, but Alan Godfrey isn't the only one who saw something in the same area on the same night. Another witness was school caretaker Leonard Smith. When I came round the, the corner to check the grounds, I looked up in the sky and this UFO was up in the sky, approximately over where I later learnt the area where Alan Godfrey had his experience. I didn't know at the time. Now the object shot across the valley four times, backwards and forwards, and it vanished over the hills. Then there's John Porter, one of five other police witnesses that night. An hour before Alan Godfrey's encounter, he was out searching moorland quarries for stolen motorbikes. We were walking down the moor from the main road. Something told me to turn around. I turned and in the sky was a very cold steel blue line. It moved in a sweeping arc across the sky, about 12 miles, I would estimate, in one second. Eventually I went up the road and observed this same cold steel blue light sweeping away in the low arc towards Todbedding, and that's the last I saw of it. Despite this support, Alan Godfrey became more and more troubled by the most puzzling part of his experience. After it had all happened, I realised that there was half an hour missing from me drawing the object to me turning up at the other side of where the object had been. I was really curious, you know, what I wanted to know what had happened in that half hour. I persuaded him to undergo regression hypnosis, and two experiments were set up. Uh, with two uh, doctors who specialised in hypnosis. The video, the uh, hypnotic regression sessions were videotaped and during them Alan fills in the missing time, the gaps in his memory. Oh. Alan describes getting out of his car, looking at the object, then he sees a, a light emanating from underneath it, so he gets back into his car, finds his car won't go, and then he's engulfed in a bright white light. There's a light. He appears to lose consciousness. Uh, he says everything is black. He then wakes up in a room where he sees a tall man. He's also surrounded by six small robots. Pardon? Isn't that horrible? Who's horrible? There. Who's they? I want to talk about them. He's made the subject of some sort of pseudo-medical examination. In due course, he's put back in his car. After the, my initial sighting, I did read quite a few science fiction books 
and it is quite possible that that part of the hypnotic regression uh, is, has got jumbled up in my mind. But I must stress that I did see a UFO that night. Make no mistake about that. I definitely saw what I saw. And nobody on this earth will ever tell me any different. So, are the people of Topmonton receiving visits from outer space? The town now has its own observatory with telescopes trained on the skies. We recently had reports of lights moving around in the sky which turned out to be nothing more than a local laser show. Also, we have to be rather cautious because we live under the flight path of two major airports, Heathrow and Manchester, and locally Manchester um, is a problem in as much as we have lights coming in on incoming aircraft which give the impression of UFOs in the sky. It was not an aircraft. I got into my van and made radio inquiries regarding this. I still saw the blue light in the sky. I made inquiries with the Army, the RAF, the Civil Aviation Authority, and nothing was in the sky at that time. A less conventional theory is that the geology of the area can produce strange sights. There are many reservoirs and quarries in the Todmorden area, and the local rock has a high concentration of quartz crystals. Scientists have found that this can produce an electrical signal, and on a grand scale, this might turn out to be glowing masses of energy, which can be seen as UFOs. I saw what I saw. That object was real. If I'd have got out of the car and thrown a brick at it, it would have gone bang. Strangely enough, even the scientists are now coming round to the view that the people of Todmorden are seeing something. Two friends and I were observing and uh, saw an object which had classic flying saucer shape. Um, we checked to make sure that the telescope we were originally using didn't have optical defects and uh, there was no problem there. Um, much as it's difficult to believe that it was of extraterrestrial origin, to this date we have no rational scientific explanation for what it was. Before his uh, close encounter, PC Alan Godfrey had been injured on duty. A hospital consultant said he'd be unable to have any more children. After his experience, the effects were reversed, and Alan Godfrey had a son. Can the human personality survive death and be born again in another body? Not a prospect that all of us would relish, but surprising though it may seem, Across the globe, those who believe in reincarnation probably outnumber those who don't. Reincarnation is one of the oldest beliefs, dating back to 1000 BC in India. When they're close to death, some people in Alaska believe so strongly that they even choose their next set of parents. The woman whose story we're about to tell believes reincarnation explains the dream she's had ever since she can remember. Jenny Coquel looks like any ordinary mother. Happily married with two children, she lives in the Northamptonshire town of Toaster. But Jenny has always believed that she is also the mother of another family. For as long as I can remember, I've had dreams of being Mary in Ireland and dying while the children were still young, not grown, in the 1930s. Terrible dreams of being alone in a room in pain not at home, and knowing that there's nothing I could do to ensure the safety of the children's futures. During waking hours, I remembered happier memories from the life as Mary. I remembered the children at meal times. But Jenny also sensed trouble in the family. I didn't know quite why. I should feel so uneasy and so concerned what it was that I was really afraid of. Something I was shutting out. Shut up, you bitch! You get up! Get up, bitch! The memories were a little bit like pieces of a jigsaw. Some parts were very clear, some parts were vague, and there were so many bits that seemed to be missing, it was difficult to try to get the whole picture. As soon as she could pick up a pencil, Jenny began drawing maps of the village she saw in her mind, the main roads, the station and her cottage. And when she got a school atlas, she could even locate where it was. And after several attempts, just shutting my eyes and allowing myself to be drawn to a place that might feel familiar, I found 
that Malahide was named just north of Dublin. For years, Jenny kept these strange visions of Ireland to herself, until at last she could hold back no longer. She had to find out if the memories meant anything. She began at her local bookshop, ordering a map of the Malahide area to confirm her childhood drawings. The maps matched, for Jenny a first glimmer of proof. Now she needed more, and tried hypnosis to plumb her deeper memories. And just drift away. Just drift off into deep, deep relaxation. One, two, It sharpened deep. up a great deal of the detail. Three, there was a, one of the churches I Four, saw the outside fairly clearly, clearly enough really to make a little drawing afterwards of it. And standing at the end of a jetty, wrapped in a dark shawl, it was dusk, and I remembered waiting for a boat, but I had no idea who was on the boat or why I was waiting for a boat. You see where you are. But were these real memories, or just an overactive imagination? It gets difficult to believe that when you see the consistency of uh, the facts and the findings of the, the memories between one session and the next. And Jenny's been through several sessions of this at different times, uh, and each time she's been consistent in what she's been telling me. It was enough for Jenny to invest in a trip to Malahide. This was the first time she'd been to Ireland, and yet she felt certain she'd been there before. I didn't need a map, I knew my way around. I tried to find somebody who might remember the family, who might remember the children. Back in England, Jenny received a letter from an old man in Malahide. Relating to the mother who died in the 1930s, she was Mrs. Sutton. After her death, the children were sent to orphanages. It was the breakthrough Jenny needed. She was able to get a copy of Mary Sutton's death certificate, and from an orphanage came the first names of her children. An appeal in an Irish newspaper then produced a telephone number for the oldest boy, Sonny. Hello, um, my name is Jenny Corkell. Sort of frightened. And I've been trying to in one trace way. members of your family. Can I said to me, wife, there's something weird here. So I don't know who this person is. And so how did she come to know so much about the family? You said that she remembers about the jetty. Well, I explained to her that uh, that I used to have a little job as a caddy, and we used to row over to the island. And in the evening, we would be rowed back again. Thanks very much, Mr. Nugent. Well, Sonny. And she greeted me at the top of the steps. And used to have a, she used to cuddle me. With Sonny's help, the picture was finally becoming clear. The pieces of the jigsaw were going in and making things a lot easier to understand. And most of all, he was able to explain to me what I had been afraid of. My mother was a loving person. She loved her husband and she loved her family. Can you just read it through there for me again? But my father was the opposite. My mother was only there for the convenience. He was cruel to my mother. He was cruel to his children. He'd come home from work and he'd be socially drunk. Then start belting her around. And then many, many a time I used to get between him and my mother. But I saved my mother. Mary Sutton died at the age of 32. Her children were taken away, all except Sonny, who had to keep house for his father. It was very painful, because I was lo I've lost my mother, and now what then I was going to lose my brothers and sisters. And when they were taken away, it was very, very hurtful and very painful. I knew that I couldn't settle until the family were reunited. That part of me that was Mary needed to see the children happy. One by one, Jenny tracked down not only Sonny, but all the surviving Sutton children. 
and a few weeks ago at the home of youngest sister Betty, they were reunited, all together again for the first time in 61 years. Oh, Christy. It's Betty, is it? It is indeed. How are you, love? Great, and yourself? Come on. Brothers Frank and Christy, Phyllis and Sonny. Hello, Betty. Unknown to Phyllis, she and Betty had lived within 15 minutes of each other for 40 years. And it's Phyllis who appears in the only photo of their mother, Mary. They're all about to meet the woman who believes she is Mary, back from the dead. Hi, Jenny. How are you? So, Jenny Coquel has reunited a lost family. But are they convinced she's the reincarnation of their mother? The priest only lives across from us, Father McCarthy. And I said, Father, send me three. I want the truth, though, I said. Do you believe in reincarnation? He said, that is all I can answer, Chris. He said, is that your mother is calling from heaven. Mm. And it's coming through you. Mm. Jenny's dreams mm. are mommy's thoughts. Basically, my, my opinion is that mum wanted us all together again. And Jenny was the lucky the, one that, the children, yeah. that uh, she chose and put her soul into Jenny. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. Well, do you want to the steps are there? And to complete the reunion, a homecoming. Back to the remains of the humble cottage in Malahide that the family left after the death of their beloved here. mother. She is back again. I, I believe that my mother is not passed on. She hasn't passed over, as we say. The wounds of the years of separation, the wounds of not knowing where my brothers and sisters were. Those wounds, Jenny is healed now. Because now I know where they are. I know they're alive and well. And those are our stories. I don't think you'd argue about their strangeness, but whether we believe them is for each of us to decide. Harry Price spent most of his 67 years on this earth trying to find the answers to such mysteries. But he didn't gain much public recognition, and he died in 1948, a disappointed man. If he'd lived until today, he'd have seen more and more people following in his footsteps, visiting psychics, experimenting with hypnosis, trying to communicate with the spirits, or simply just reading their horoscopes. Yet whatever we do, the truth remains as elusive and as tantalizing as ever. For now, good night. <laughs>